training session, I will travel around with the mic to you um, so you can ask questions and I'll have them here online. So keep that in mind. That's coming down the road later. Um, with that, I'm excited to introduce Molly McCabe as one of our speakers today. She occupies the financing portion of our lecture series, so if you remember, the uh, overall title is From Origins to Operations, Envisioning, Financing, Designing, and Operating High Performance Buildings. So we're try really trying to cover the entire spectrum of how to procure these types of high performance and sustainable projects, and Molly fits into the financing side of, of that equation. Um, so she is the president and co-founder co of Hayden Tanner, which is a uh, sustainable real estate consulting firm. And she brings to the table 20 years of professional experience in commercial real estate business and also uh, a very kind of new and comprehensive understanding of the triple bottom line as it relates to sustainability's intersection with business. So I think those two things really give her a unique experience to be able to share um, with us today. And the way that I, I view uh, Molly's services, we've worked with her a couple times in some of our uh, existing building renewal projects or our deep renovation projects. And, you know, at the lab, you know, we've, we've got our heads around the technical aspect of sustainability, we do a lot of energy analysis, you know, we're getting energy cost savings numbers, energy uh, savings numbers in general. But when we want to talk to the owner and really build the case for why they need to do these uh, energy efficiency upgrades, that's where we bring Molly in, the big guns, as we put it, um, to really communicate to them the value um, at the enterprise level, tenant level, and owner level of what these things start to bring to their business. So that's really where Molly fits in to our equation. Um, so she has a bachelor's degree from UC Davis and an MBA from the University of San Francisco. And she currently resides in the northwest part of Montana. So she's gone from the two extreme climates of the Pacific Northwest. And would you please help me welcome her to Boise. Thanks, Jake. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, yes, I live up in Big Fork, Montana. Have been there uh, since 1997. So uh, it's been a while. So I have been working on a number of projects with the, uh, with the labs and specifically around deep energy retrofits. And so we'll talk a lot about that today. There is a component on financing in here, but I think it's the, like practically the very last slide. So we'll get to that. But I think what's really critical for you to understand is how, how to make the business case. Because what we're finding in the markets today is that it takes a much more compelling case and it's much more um, integrated than it has been in the past. So I'm going to sort of walk you through what we're doing, how I'm looking at the value proposition, and how we're integrating not merely you know, energy costs and energy savings, but also impact on owner and investor value, tenant or occupant benefits, enterprise benefits to the larger corporate or other entity, and then community benefits and how that plays out in, from a value perspective. And then how do you then take that to somebody to get financing and or other equity? So I don't think you need a whole lot about this. Um, this is me. My background is in finance. I was at uh, Wells Fargo before I, Wells Fargo and Bank of America before I came to Montana, and I ran my own consulting firm and ran a commercial mortgage-backed securities firm when I moved here. So I have a deep uh, understanding and experience in the finance industry. So I want to talk a little bit about the existing buildings project just so you have a sense of what we're doing and what the labs are doing right now in the deep energy retrofit. We are currently working in Seattle, Portland, Boise, and we are just about finished with the project in Montana. It is the first project I have ever worked on in Montana in my entire however many years I've been there. So I don't, I don't work there very frequently. And the buildings range in size from about 20,000 square feet to over 500,000 square feet in these four markets. They range from, they're all multi-tenant, so all investor owned in some way, shape, or form. And they all, um, and they have very differing ownership structures. I think that's one of the most interesting things in terms of how we're presenting the value proposition is that they, it ranges from, you know, my Montana project is a single owner, you know, as I said, 20,000 square foot building, six stories, you know, local tenants, to some of the projects in Portland and Seattle, which have, 
you know, large institutional tenants and institutional owners, REIT, uh, REIT ownership, and so forth. So that's been an interesting project. So keep that in mind as we go through this, that we are trying to scale this from the small building individual owner to a large, more institutional owner who has to go out, like on the REIT project I'm working on, it's a publicly traded real estate investment trust. So they have quarterly investor meetings with the investment markets out of Wall Street. So what we're finding is that the green retrofits are absolutely the single most important measure that any owner can take to improve their property values. Now I know Ashley talked a lot last week, talked mostly last week about new construction. I'm going to talk more about existing buildings today, primarily because I think, at least in my mind, this is a harder market, this is a harder nut to crack. Because in all the projects that I'm working on, on the new construction side, I am not seeing significant cost premiums for new construction. Because in all of the markets that I'm working in, for the most part, including here, most of the new construction that's going up has a high performance component to it. We are not seeing new construction going up that does not take that into account. So I'm particularly focused on, you know, some sort of minimum level of LEED certification or Energy Star rating because the market is demanding it. Tenants are demanding it. Oops. The ability to sustain this is the long-term benefit of a project. And so what we're looking at for real estate assets that are 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 year assets is what do you need to do in order to sustain that asset and how do you maintain the value over time? How do you reposition it? How do you renew it? How do you modernize the building given where you're at? So here's the paradigm shift. What's the first thing that people ask you when you're going out and you talk about sustainability? Anybody? How much is it going to cost? What's my return and how quickly do I get it? What's the simple payback? And more recently, this is the other question I'm getting. How much free money do I get? <clears throat> What are the incentives? That's, I'm working on a project in Portland right now, and that was the very first question the client asked me. So this is great, but how much free money do I get? And what we're finding on the incentive side is there are incentives out there, and there are some, and there are some good ones, but a lot of times they're really not the most compelling reason to do the project. All the projects I'm doing right now have a minimum energy savings of 35% or greater. And in Three of the four, they're greater than 50% savings on existing buildings that were built sometime, you know, 1960, 1970-ish, maybe as late as 80. So the incentives are not the most compelling reason to do this. So what we're looking at is, a, is we need to have a paradigm shift because if, if I say to somebody, or if somebody asks me, what's your simple payback? they are really underestimating and undervaluing the returns because really all they're doing is they're trying to figure out what their cost recovery is. So they're, they're, they're projecting underperformance of the sustainability measures that they're taking. And so you as a professional or you as an owner, when you're going out and talking to tenants or government officials or your own investors, you need to understand that the cost, the energy savings alone, simply project a limited component of the value. So really we need to shift our paradigm and look to the future and understand what are those emerging trends. One of the primary drivers today, tenants. In every market I'm working in, the tenants are driving owners to make these high performance choices for a variety of reasons, whether they're law firms or technology firms, and so forth. So that's, those are some of the emerging trends. We're also looking at risks associated with energy price escalations and a number and regulations coming into play. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So really it's about making judgments and decisions today, looking forward because you're going to want, you want to cope with uncertainty and you want to exploit that uncertainty. So here's the context. 
And I talked about this in the beginning because it's relevant as you look at your tenant, as you look at your ownership mix. My good friend James Finley from Wells Fargo Bank has put together what he calls the seven tribes of real estate. And we're going to focus on numbers two, three, and four. Small, commercial, and industrial sort of small mom and pop ownership, less than $2 million in value. Medium, commercial, and industrial, which is a lot of the markets that I work in. I think a lot of the buildings here are sort of in that 2 to $10 million range. You know, again, my Missoula project sort of fits into that. Um, and then the large commercial and industrial, multi-tenant lease investment. That's my institutional owners. That's the real estate investment trust, pension funds, folks like that. Those are more the national companies. This is relevant because each of them has different ways of looking at things. So if you look at the top of this thing, of uh, this period, this is the, these are some of the reasons that they ask you about simple payback. You look at the, and this is why you hear it a lot from your, your large commercial and industrial owners, because they want to turn the building in three years. Now, of course, the, la the market recently has been less than that, or has been longer than that, but versus the small commercial industrial, eight to ten years. So they're actually holding the asset for longer. So they are actually, in some way, an easier market to, to talk to about energy savings and other types of sustainability features because they're planning on holding the building. Now, when you, if you look to the large CNI, just because they have a short investment horizon, do you think that your energy savings stop after your payback, whether it's a three-year payback or a 10-year payback? No. So when you actually value the property and somebody's trying to buy it, they will value those energy savings over time. So in fact, the three-year payback or the five-year payback requirement is really an inappropriate measure of how you calculate return. So again, some of the challenges are you have, from an investment analysis sophistication, the small C&I is fairly limited. You know, maybe they're looking at what their capitalization rate is. So fairly, or maybe, you know, per square foot what something else is selling for. Versus, you know, on the large C&I, it's going to be fairly, fairly uh, sophisticated. And again, risk appetite adverse to fairly sophisticated. They're making investment decisions. Some people are afraid. So again, I want you to understand that there's a context when you're speaking to different owners and from different perspectives. I may plan on holding it, but somebody else might not. And my returns, my return hurdles and my investment choices may be very different than yours. Maybe I'm going to invest in this or in the stock market. Or maybe I'm going to invest in energy efficiency or I'm going to invest in my, my shop, which sells clothing or sporting goods. So you're making investment choices and looking at returns. Okay. So what we're trying to do, and the way I'm viewing things in the way, at least in all the projects I'm working on, we're moving from simple payback to discounted cash flow, which is a traditional way for real, for real estate appraisers to value buildings, 10-year discounted cash flow model. You know what are the what are the what are the benefit? You know what are the uh, inputs? What are the returns coming in, and what are the costs going out? The income coming in, going out, and then discounted back over ten years to what I call a total value analysis, which takes into account things like what, how long does it take me to release the building? Am I able to reposition the asset, and instead of getting, you know. $13 a square foot, I'm able to get $14 a square foot in rent. What's the impact in terms of my tenant mix? Are they going to stay longer? And those things support the numbers on the rent side and on the vacancy side and so forth. So, And it also you look to the community, you look at the, the community values. So if I'm able to increase, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, if I'm able to increase the value of my building, what does that do to the neighborhood? What does that do to the community? Can you then increase taxes? So then the city feels that's a good benefit, so perhaps they're willing to invest in you and provide you with some incentives. So again, we're looking at this total value analysis. Because the intersection of the profit, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find that intersection where you optimize your profit, value, and your investment return and stabilize those returns. Because that's the biggest killer of any investment is risk. 
All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the property value and how the returns run through property first. And then I'm going to move into tenants, enterprise, and community, and then we'll go into the financing piece. If anybody has questions in the middle, please ask. Four drivers, four things drive financial value. Income at the property level. Income, expense, vacancy, and risk. You know, people say, would you rather get an 8% return or a 15% return? Okay, so do you want to invest in do you want to invest in IBM or would you like to invest in junk bonds? Treasuries or junk bonds? So part of you know so part of the, the question on the risk side is can I reduce my risk? Does the market believe that my risk is lower? So there is a return component to making a choice on value. Okay. Now I admit this is a big building because you have fifteen million dollars in revenue. So I okay. So I I didn't recalculate this, but this this scale. So rent. This is a very simple example. You know, your rents are fifteen million dollars. You have you have your operating expense, maintenance, and utilities, and then you have your this is you know. I know that there's a. I'm just going to come over and point. <laughs> Because I'd be afraid I'd do the video. So then your risk, in this case, you're assuming a capitalization rate or a required return of 8.5%. You know, in a lot of markets, that's pretty high, an 8.5% return. But very simply, ooh, I knew it. I knew I'd do the wrong one. Okay, I'm not going to point in. So very simply, if we're able to reduce our utilities, in this case, we have an annual energy savings. We originally started at 567,000. We go to 396,000. If we're able to reduce our energy savings by $170,000 at an 8.5% return, the value difference on that building, because as you go through, your total operating expenses are $170,000 less. Your net income then is $170,000 more. You divide your net income by your required rate of return, in this case, 8.5%, and you make $2 million more on that building just by redoing the lighting, just by doing some operations and maintenance, whatever it is that gets your, your energy costs down. Now, if I can take my capitalization rate and I drop that by another point, then that $2 million goes up to $2.7 million. Because they now believe that my risk level, because my energy costs are lower, is also lower. Because this, if you can reduce your operating expenses, then the equity investor, the bank, feels that your exposure to volatility in the market is lower. So those are sort of the four key drivers of value. So there's my $2 million. But remember, this is what they're going to ask me. How, how long is it going to take me to pay back that investment, whatever that is? And how much free money do I get? Because that's what I'm going to get asked all the time. What is it going to cost me to get that $170,000 savings? And how many years does it take me before that $170,000 pays back my original investment? Yeah. So the question was, how much free money is there out there in the market um, as a general percentage of the total cost? Um, so the free money is falling into what I currently am finding maybe three or four categories. So utility incentives. Uh, if you can take advantage of tax credits or tax deductions, such as the 179D tax deduction, or and one of the more promising ones today is something called is, is, is accelerated depreciation, where you actually divide your property asset up into personal property and real estate assets. Um, 
There are some other funds, depending on the district you're in, like in Seattle used to have climate, the Carbon Reduction Incentive Fund, which paid per ton of carbon reduced. Um, and there are a few a handful of others, but they're not very big. You know, candidly, I, I think I mentioned this to a couple people when they came in, in all the projects I'm working today, the incentives are a nice bonus. They are not the driver. So I had one of my projects was a $2 million project, and the only incentives I could get were $5,000. That's like, oh, bonus. But so, you know, on my analysis, I include it. So I'm working on a project right now, which is a $3.5 million project, and I'm hoping to get $50,000 in incentives on that. In my head, I can't run that percentage, but it's not very high. Maybe one of you guys can. So, so you know, the incentives are not, and what, you know, what's interesting is people only want to do it if they're incentive. But the reality is that's not really the driver. It's a nice bonus, and I think it, I think what it does is it's a smoke screen. I don't want to do it unless they're incentive, and I think it's just one more excuse not to learn and understand it. That's, again, my perspective on it. So these are the red herrings, you know. Payback is not the problem. Poorly defined risk is the problem. An insufficient catalog of benefits is the problem. If the only thing you're looking at is energy savings, you have missed an entire suite of integrated values and benefits that are not being incorporated into your value proposition. Financing is not the problem because really people are the ones that are driving the market, buyers and sellers. It's not the bankers, it's not the appraisers, it's the buyers and sellers. So if you can create the understanding and articulate the value, then people will, in fact, buy it. There are several studies, although the question was asked earlier today whether or not there are any specific to the Pacific Northwest, and the answer is no, but there are several studies nationally that are showing that for po properties that have high-performance buildings, on a comparable basis, they are commanding higher rent than comparable buildings and are commanding higher sales values. Now, what I would tell you is that does not is not the same as a premium. I do not believe that any asset will garner a premium in the market. What I believe is it may command the top value in a market in its competitive class, but only within its competitive class. It will not get, you're not going to see that just because it has a lead rating that it's going to get more, you know, substantially more because it's got a lead rating. That's not going to happen. The null hypothesis, if you don't, you know, if you do something that there is no value, is not true. All things being equal, you have two buildings side by side. One of them has some high performance features or has energy savings or other sustainability features that building is going to get leased first. And that building will probably get leased at a slightly higher rate and have lower vacancy, lower downtime, which translates is monetizable in the market. So I'm going to do, I want to look at a risk assessment. I'm going to show you one slide first, which is just relevant nationally because this is a risk. And then I'll go to sort of a litany of, of other risks. The U.S. benchmarking policy landscape. So this shows you all of the states within the United States that have some disclosure or benchmarking requirements. Idaho is not one of them, nor is my home state of Montana, although my real home state, my original home state of California does have them. Um, but what we're seeing is even in Utah, you know, in Utah, public buildings are required to be benchmarked. In South Dakota and Kansas, residential disclosure is required. This is a wave that is coming across the country because it's the only way that we have metrics around whether or not this works. And so in New York State, or in New York City, of course, they are actually requiring disclosure for all buildings over 50,000 square feet of all their energy use, public data. In Seattle, it's, it, it, it's only when the property changes hands or there's a major transaction. So it goes to the government 
But if you're selling a property, then someone will know what the energy use of this building is. And if they're making a decision between this building and that building, they will know which one has greater energy use, which translates into the bottom line net operating income. So this is a risk that's coming, even if it's not here yet. <laughs> they don't have public buildings benchmarks, for example, nor have they adopted residential disclosure. So um, California, of course, is is almost it's driven by their PUC, you know, and Cal, you know. I, you know, right now I'm only working in the Pacific Northwest where we have about seven cents a kilowatt hour of electricity costs versus California, which is about 14 cents. You know, you start going back to the East Coast where it's up in the, you know, 18, 19, 20s. Um, it's mostly city driven. Most of the disclosure requirements were started at the city level. So it's communities making the decision that this is important to us. And so therefore we're going to put things on our books to make that happen. So I think you know, it sort of starts, bubbles up from there. I, I do think California is a bit of an anomaly because of that. Boston, for example, has a huge sustainability component. They have a whole department that's focused on that. Um, I know. I don't know. I can't answer that. I haven't done anything in South Dakota or Kansas. So, you know, I, that's what I looked at today. I went, oh, I wonder what that means. Um, Montana's not on it. You know, Austin is also a particularly active city. Um, in terms of that, and particularly their utilities, they are very active. So, driving wise, drivers, I, in terms of like South Dakota and Kansas, I don't know. So, in terms of risks, what we're looking at and is the opportunity by doing high performance buildings is to reposition the asset and hedge risk against. Disclosure regulation, disclosure regulations, benchmarking, requirements that the cities or the states are putting on, hedging energy volatility, energy price escalation, um, things like that. And it's really about avoiding functional and economic obsolescence for the building. If you compare a building today that is new, they will all be high performance for the most part. And so if your building is older, you have to compete against that. And are you willing to drop to that next class of buildings? Because that next, you know, if you're dropping from a class A building to a class B building, or even A minus or B plus, that equates to a drop in rent per square foot. So part of what we're looking at is, is when we talk about a value proposition, we're looking at, so here's where you're at today. Here's what your competitive mix is for other buildings in the marketplace. And this building has lower energy costs and it has better air quality more comfort, they can control their, they can control airflow at their desks or in their space, they have better light. That's your competitive mix. And so what you are trying to do with these high performance features, whether it's, you know, changing out the HVAC, you know, new HVAC or new lighting, new windows, new uh, envelope measures, things like that, is really creating an environment where the occupants want to be there, which again, you know, a lot of people say, well, why wouldn't I just put my money in doing the lobby and making my lobby nicer? And that's a really good thing. But what's your payback on marble in your lobby? You know, I can calculate what the payback is on my energy cost. I can, I can tell you that when I don't have to go and deal with maintenance calls because this person here has got a sweater on and that person over there is, you know, pulling theirs off because they're hot and, you know, the air is blowing up on somebody's legs or down on their head. That costs me maintenance costs as an owner to send somebody up there to repair it. Or water infiltration through the windows, you know. All those things cost money and there's a way to monetize that and value that. Increased tenant retention, increased tenant reach quality and quantity. So the U.S. government and many state and city governments require Energy Star or lead buildings before they will even consider going into a building. So what you've just done is shortlisted yourself if you have those two, one or, or the other certification. And albeit, now that the federal government is working, their credit is probably better than it was yesterday. Generally speaking, the federal government has higher quality credit as a tenant. 
we go back to that question on, on risk. If we go back to the question on risk, that means if I have the federal government or another government or corporate eight, uh, entity in my building, I have lower risk, easier to finance, easier for an investor to make a decision to go into my building because probably they're going to continue to pay rent. Tenant retention, if my tenants are more comfortable, they aren't cold, they aren't hot, they, you know, they can control their, set, their air to, coming to them, they have better light, they're probably going to stay in the building. And what we're seeing nationally is about a 10% increase in tenant retention. So if you assume that 65% of your tenants will stay in your building, as just generally speaking, what we're seeing nationally and what we vetted with several appraisers nationally, is it's about increasing to maybe 75%. So you're seeing a 10% differential. So if a tenant stays, what am I not paying out? One, I don't have vacant space, so I have, I have rents coming in. Two, I don't have to pay leasing commissions for, new, for a new tenant coming in. And three, I don't have to pay for brand new tenant improvements. Those are all avoided costs, which if I make these investments, pay off and, and you're able to monetize. Yes? We're saying in a high performance building. We're, now what my perspective on lead and energy star is it's a proxy for quality of management and I think that's what most tenants are using it for and most investors are using that as a proxy for quality. You know, if you're willing to go the extra mile to get your building Energy Star rated or LEED certified, then you probably are managing the building fairly well, and I don't have to do a lot of due diligence to figure it out. That's obviously not always the case, but that's sort of my sense of it. But we're using, I'm using that term more generically in terms of high performance buildings, you know, coming out of studies with NREL and PNL and, and several other folks out there. Yes? Mm -hmm. so, so obviously somebody's going to drop out. Are there other risks and benefits that um, come in to the question? So for institutionally owned buildings where, repeating, institutionally owned buildings where um, the occupants are the owners, generally speaking, whether it's state owned or say uh, colleges or campus buildings, are there other, are there other sort of risk factors or other sort of benefits? There are, and what, and we'll talk about this in a minute because you can then, you then just start to look at Again, long-term planning. If you look at long-term planning on energy price escalation, I as, a, I as a, say, university, am going to put into my budget some estimation on what my energy price, prices, what my energy costs are going to be over time. And if I can then reduce the volatility of that and reduce the risk, I can then say, okay, I can now take this 20% that I was going to spend on energy costs and I can redeploy that into either some other investment, some other capital project, because I have some sort of confidence level in that. We'll also then talk about the impact on the occupants themselves and actually monetizing some of the health and productivity benefits. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a sec. And again, power resiliency, a durable in, income stream, because again, you're reducing your volatility. Your, your income stream is now much more reliant on your rents and less on some of the operating expenses that may float around. And, if you are able to, so if you think about it from an investment perspective, if I take money and I invest it in my building, in energy efficiency or other sort of sustainability features, I've now, I can control that. I can make sure that I, I, somebody goes out and commissions the building. I can make sure that I have management on staff that understands how the systems work. I can make sure I have a tenant engagement plan so I work on behavior issues so that they turn off their plug loads and their lights at night and, and they don't leave their computers on. I can control that. On the other hand, I can take that same $2 million and I can invest it in the stock market. Where do I have more control over my return? So part of what you're choosing to do is how do you make your investment? What's that investment that you're making? And where, again, where's my risk profile? How do I feel? Where's my comfort level in that? Excellent question. Is it the same value proposition if it's an A, B, C, or C class building? Um, I think the short answer is yes. I think on the A class buildings, there is absolutely no doubt that from a C 
sale perspective, from an investor sale perspective, because most of those A buildings will be in the investment market, um, you will absolutely get a higher, higher, somebody will think it's worth more, so therefore they will pay more. And that's where the market will trade. When you start to get to the C-class buildings, what's interesting to me is if you reduce energy costs, your utilities or your overhead, where that translates to is to your tenant. So your tenant then reduces the risk on your tenant because they're paying lower, you know, common area maintenance charges. Whatever your pass-throughs are to your tenant, which means that you're, you're reducing the risk for your tenant. So that means your tenant is more able, to, you know, more able to pay their rent. So it's a, it's a bit of a different, you articulate it maybe a little bit differently. So I think, yes, the value proposition is there across all sectors. It's really a matter of how you frame it. Thank you. Top button is a pointer. All right. I'm. Oh, the red one. Thank you. Got it. Okay. There we go. All right. Got it. All right. So this is this this is the um, this is the concept that you know the null assumption is zero. So this is Hanley Wood, which does a cost value analysis for residential projects. So what this is, this shows you. Um, uh, aggregate cost. The cost line is the aggregate cost of renovations nationally. These are the years. And then when you sell the property, this is what you get back, right? And so what you're seeing is that no matter what, no matter what the average, no matter what your, re what your retrofit is, you're getting at least 57% back when you sell it. So if you put money into an investment of high performance, the likelihood is that at a minimum, you're going to get almost 60% of that cost back. So the concept that just because we don't know does not equal zero. Don't know does not equal zero. Okay, so it's not simple payback. We're going to look at the property, the tenant, enterprise, and then the community. Okay, property level analysis. Now we're going to get into numbers. So we talked about, you know, income, expense, vacancy, and risk. Here's where it comes into play. And again, I owe this to my good friend from James Finley. His green 14. Income, primarily rent. Expenses, utilities, maintenance, management, marketing. We can talk about the PR value of, of branding your building as a high-performance building. Insurance costs, and there are uh, folks like uh, Fireman's Fund and so forth who are giving us a discount, like about a 5% discount on insurance for green buildings, green rated buildings, and property taxes. Now, property taxes are inter interesting because, of course, if your property value goes up, your property value, your property taxes go up. So, um, you know, so that's the opposite side of it. Um, vacancy, absorption. How long does it take for the space to release? How long does it take for you to lease your space? What's your stabilized vacancy? Is your stabilized vacancy 5%, 10%? What do you expect for vacancy? What's your percent tenant, tenant retention? How many stay? Lag vacancy is, you know, how long is it vacant when they leave? Is it six months? Is it three months? Is it 12 months? And then what is the cost of your tenant improvement? What do you have to pay to get somebody else in the building? And then the other thing on that I would also include on probably under vacancy is also um, leasing commissions because you have to pay leasing commissions if you lose it. And then the risk is the discount rate. So if you're doing, if you have an appraiser doing a net, a 10 year discount of cash flow, what's the discount rate? What's their assumption on the risk that they're going to use? And then what's the capitalization rate? What's your investor required return? This is where it shows up in the number. Here's, if you do a sensitivity analysis and you want to see what absolutely drives the numbers, the biggest chunk, Tenant rollover percentage, so that's that 10% that I talked about earlier. Huge impact on value and cash flow return. Tenant improvements and commissions. And then what's your rent loss? How long is that, that space vacant because you don't have a tenant in there? These are absolutely the biggest drivers of value. So if you can reduce any one of these, and better yet all three, you will see an increase in your property value. All right, so you aren't going to be able to read this because I have another slide that actually drills into this. But this is a, a small project, about 23,000 square feet. We did a VRF heat pump system on it, six-story building. And so this is the way I'm running my analyses. 
So here's the value premise of what I'm show, showing over here in this increase. This is, this is where we're seeing the value. So most of the time, all, the only thing you're going to get when you talk to and in, when you talk to somebody about energy or other sustainability features is what's the, what's the payback, which means I'm just telling you how much is it going to cost, how, much, how long will it take for that $170,000 I showed you earlier to pay back my investment. But really what I'm saying is that that is a limited view of what your returns really are. What your returns really ought to include is rent revenue differential between class B space and class B minus in this particular case. This is my building, a building that was going to be, is about a B minus right now. Maybe, it's not a C, but it's pretty close to a C. So the difference in that is about a dollar a square foot. So as your space rolls, you're going to get, if you do this high performance and then you do all the, you know, PR and press around it and, the, and your tenants are more comfortable, you'll see about a dollar a square foot increase in rent. This is the number in this particular case. I vetted with the owner. Are you comfortable with this? Does this seem reasonable? And we bracket it. We'll do sensitivity analysis around it. Well, what if it's only 50 cents a foot that you get increased? What if it's zero? What if it's $2? So they can look at the analysis and say, this makes sense or it doesn't, and I feel comfortable with it. Then the question is, in this particular case, we were able to, because of the integrated design that the uh, IDL put together, we were, able to we were able to find some additional square footage that was rentable. Because, you know, when you do an integrated design, you can often reduce the size of the equipment that's going in. In this case, it was on the top floor for the penthouse. So now I have more space that I can rent out. Again, added value. On the operating expense, in this case, we have decreased maintenance costs in this particular year because of this, this building, um, which had a major retrofit going on. We were able to reduce, you know, the um, refrigerant charge and tech fees and so forth. So, again, looking at your operating expenses, what's the expense, what's the value? And then the decreased energy costs. So, in this case, we kept it flat for four years, increasing 2% for years 5 through 10. Uh, in other projects, I'm working on a project right now in Portland where the Estimation, estimate of energy price escalation is about 4.9%. Um, another project that's sort of ranging between 4 to 55 6%, and then dropping back down flat. I'm doing the same thing on natural gas, based on what we're seeing um, in the national market as, as focused on the Pacific Northwest for the projects I'm working on. So again, tenant impact, tenant retention. So if I have a 10% increase from 65 to 75%, I have a reduced absorption period, so that equates to least space. So I'm avoiding the cost of tenants leaving. Avoided turnover, tenant retention, $15 a square foot in tenant improvements that I don't have to pay on that 10% of my space because I'm going to keep those tenants in place. 6% leasing commission. Now in this case, we actually did the delta on the difference between new a new lease and a renewal of a lease. So it's just the difference between those two rather than the full amount. But again, these are avoided costs that are real numbers. These are real numbers that if you lose a tenant, you have to pay. <clears throat> and again, we are looking at here, we're looking at the cap rate of 7.5% say versus an 8.5% cap rate. So at the end, of the, at the, end of, the, of the property lifetime, you're looking at a less risky building and so therefore higher value. Yes? As high as 10%. I can provide you with some of that. I'm working on getting to BOMA, the Building Owners and Managers Association, to give me some data that will have particular estimates on that tenant retention piece. So. I'd be happy to provide it to uh, the IDL and have them pass it out. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, go back. It's somewhat relevant to this slide, also the one a couple before about absorption. This one is lag banking being absorption. Is this the same thing monetarily for an owner? Or are they different concepts that <coughs> show up in two line items on your total value analysis? The way I'm doing it, it shows up in one. The way James described it, he's showing it as two. Absorption is sort of more that front end. How long does it take to get leased up? Well, how much? How much space is being leased every month, for example? 
um, lag vacancy is how long after space goes vacant does it take to release it. All right, so again, I'm going to give you a this is a this is that same 23,000 square foot building. So this is this is actual, this is what we projected. So in this case, we are looking at so remember I told you a dollar square foot, right? So it's currently getting existing rents are $13.88 excluding can is excluding their common area maintenance charges. We're suggesting that they raise their rates after their retrofit to $14.88. Dollar square foot. Currently, the tenants are paying $7.05 a foot in common area maintenance, utility, all, everything that's included in that number. Afterwards, they're going to pay $5.51. So my net number, my average cost of my tenant currently is $20.93. My new cost on this building is $20.39. So that means the tenants are actually going to be paying less in this particular building after this retrofit than they're currently paying. So a lot of people say to me, well, my leases say that I just have a pass-through. And so now they're only going to pay $5.51, which technically your leases are, do say that. But the reality is when those leases roll, or if you go to the tenants and say, you know, on a net-net basis, I'm going to charge you $0.50 cents less than I'm currently charging you for space that is more comfortable, that you can control the temperature, that you have better light in. I have a hard time saying that, that tenant is going to say, you know, I'd like to move to that Class C building across the street. I, you know, so this is an actual building that we just did. So, you know, this is re these are real numbers in, in this 23,000 square foot building. Now, again, in that building, the leases are not that long, maybe three years. So we have, you know, the ability to turn them fairly quickly. So some of what we're starting to do is looking at how we're writing leases so that they're a little bit different than they were before. All right, so I'm going to give you, I have two examples. The first one, I have two slides for this first example, just so you can see kind of what energy savings we're get, getting. So right now, in this case, we are, and I, because the energy cost per square foot were a little too, you might have been able to figure out what the billing was. I decided to pull those out. Now, I know that's my fee. Trying to be confidential here. So in this case, we have about a 40% reduction in energy cost, which because energy costs are only a percentage of operating expenses, it equates to about 11% reduction in, in, in operating expenses. Our EUI, our energy use intensity, is going from a current of 73.5 down to 42.8. Again, a 42% drop in energy use. Their current energy star rating is 57. We project their energy star rating will be 91 afterwards, which is a 60% increase in their energy star rating. They currently don't have any LEED certification, for obvious reasons. But assuming that they do some other things, in this case we're talking um, EV, O&M, um, some water, they could probably get from gold to platinum, given how many points they get from their energy savings. So the question is, does this have value in the marketplace? What we're seeing is that it does have value in the marketplace. Moving from lead gold, lead platinum, moving from an energy star rating of 57 to 91 has absolute credibility in the marketplace that this is a well-managed, well-operation, well-managed, well-run building that will cost me as a tenant less money. Yes, Ken. This building we're not done with yet. This one we're actually going to finance everything. And this is a uh, greater than $10 million retrofit. Now, we're going to be financing it from a variety of sources, including some bonds, some you know, qualified energy conservation bonds, and a few other, some capital leases, because we've got some windows, and we're going to do in some variety. But this is, a fully, this is actually fully financed in this particular case. Yes. Yes. So on my Montana project, so the question was, you know, on small buildings, are, are uh, banks and appraisers, do they understand it well enough to, 
And um, on my, my Montana project, good news was it was an under-leveraged building. Okay, so, the, so that's a plus. But in working with the appraiser on it, he said, this is the first building where I actually understand where the numbers come from. And so, therefore, I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. And I, it's funny you asked that because I actually took out a slide that showed the stabilized value of that building was currently was like $2.6 million. And after the retrofit, uh, he was projecting about $3.7 million. And so he said, I get it, even though in this market I have no comps to support it, but I understand where you're coming from. It makes sense to me. I can see how you'd reposition the asset, and I'm willing to give you the value. Now, and again, in this case, that particular building was under leveraged. I have had another project where the building was bought at the height of the market, you know, back in 2008. And, um, you know, because that's when financing was at the height of the market, they were giving lots of money away. That project is much more difficult to get done because I don't have a lot of equity to play with there. So there are, you know, kind of, that's a big key. What's the leverage on the building? And where are you at in the cycle of the building? You know, if the building was just renovated or it's brand new, it doesn't make any sense to do this. But if the building is looking at a major, you know, some sort of CapEx project coming in the short term, in the next, you know, two to three years, you know, this is something to really consider now. And also look at what your tenant, um, what your occupancy is and what your vacancy looks like. It's much easier to do it when the space is vacant than when, it, when you've got it fully leased. This project, fully leased, 95% leased. So we will be doing a major renovation while we have tenants in place. So we're doing, so a lot of the costs associated with this project is after hours work. We're doing it at night and on the weekends, which adds about 25% to the cost. Yes. Yes, the value had grown since it was purchased, or they put in a lot of equity. Yeah. So, all right. So in this case, so again, same project. If I so my six hundred thirty six six hundred thirty thousand dollars here of energy savings, if I did a simple payback, it's twenty five years. So if this is the only thing I show to my owner, right? D O E, right? You know, it, it, they're just not going to do it. But when I say, okay, so let's look at, take that energy savings, let's look at the value, just cap the energy savings. And in this case, this is a, you know, different market than here. I don't know what your cap rates are here. But that's a $10 million value just on the energy savings. And then if I say, let's look at, how, you know, if I have tenants in this building, which I think I do, who said, I'm going to leave unless you do something because it's so bad. I can then go and calculate what the number of, that they're going to avoid losing money. So when I say, okay, so let's look at this, you know, yes, it's $36 a foot, but when I compare that to, you know, $25 million of benefits, you know, that's a different story than 25-year payback on simple, on this, energy savings. So what we're saying is, you know, what we're finding is that when you actually start to break it down from a component piece, that energy savings in this particular case is one component of the value, but so is the impact on rent, so is the increase in rent, rentable square footage, tenant renewal, utility incentives, lower churn costs. I mean, you start to see that you start, it's additive. And if we only look at energy costs, energy savings, that really discounts the value of this type of a retrofit. My second example, in this case, it's a 58% savings in energy cost and a 50, well, that, you know, about between 50, I guess 56% in energy use all over. And in this case, my energy star rating goes from 56 to 98. So again, that has market value in many markets. All right, so I want to just talk briefly about the other components that support those rent numbers, that support the tenant retention numbers, that support the short and lag vacancy numbers, because really it's that intersection and the integration where you can support these numbers. So on an enterprise level, and I know it's a lot of words. 
on an enterprise level. So enterprise means I am Idaho Power and I own all these buildings and I have this investment or I am XYZ REIT or I am, you know, Joe and Mary and we have four buildings in Boise, at a, you know, sort of at that higher level. Brand enhancement. There are many, many tenants and many occupants who want to be in a high performance building. And you can market that. It's a strategic positioning in the marketplace. How do I compare to other players in the marketplace, other competitive buildings? Financial performance, we've already talked about that in terms of both rents and the income side, the expense side. Risk management. And then that comparative investment. I think it's really critical when, you're, when you actually look at the choices that you're making is we look at the risk and return. If I'm making a choice and I'm going to invest in one market, in one investment, how risky is it? Do I want to invest in junk bonds or do I want to invest in my building that I can control to a certain degree? And I can say, I feel com confident that this is the return I'm going to get versus a volatile stock market or something else. Again, choice. And then for some, in, for some players, and we're working on some projects where carbon reduction is a big, big issue in some of the markets I'm working in. You know, Seattle, it's a big deal. California, it's a big deal. And in, you know, as I said, in Seattle, they had the carbon reduction incentive fund. So carbon reduction not really is important from a, you know, from their uh, policy perspective, but it also added value. There's actually a dollar component associated with that. So if I'm actually at the enterprise level, I say, well, where, where does this show up in my enterprise value? Marketing and PR. How much free press do you think the Empire State Building is getting for the renovation that they're doing that they do not have to go out and pay for? They're at every single publication. They are cited by every single sustainability consultant, every organization, whether it's Energy Star or, or USGBC. So those, you know, that's free money. Not exactly the way many of my clients want, but it's free money. So then I say, well, if I'm an enterprise, if I'm IBM or I'm Apple or Google, most of their, most of their staff, many of their staff, is sort of this next generation, the millennials and the Gen Xers, maybe not my generation, but, um, and they actually care about sustainability. And so then the question is, is this a good company to work for? What is this, what's the impact on my staff recruitment and retention? We can actually come up with numbers that tie to salary. So, for example, it costs between 70 and 150 percent of, of, of estimated salary to replace staff. So, if I can retain a staff member for three months, six months, a year, you know. You can pick, pick a tenant, pick an occupant. You're going back to your question about sort of that enterprise. We can come up with a number for your particular organization, looking at the demographics of your, of your organization, where you get your staff and where you get your employees, where you get even perhaps your um, clients, you know, who your clients are. And we can actually run very specific numbers. Again, now does this flow into the property value number that I showed you? No, but does it support increased rent? Does it support increased tenant, you know, tenant retention? Yes. So part of what we're doing is creating a different narrative. We've changed the paradigm from simple payback to here's the bigger picture. Here's the strategic imperative to do this. And there are numbers to make this happen. Well, can you talk briefly about the numbers also in terms of personnel performance and is there a way to I can. I can. Did you see my slide? I can. So um, I'm going to run through these really quickly because they're interesting. Um, your question is coming up in terms of how it impacts productivity. Um, and, and I'll talk about that very specifically. And I'll show you a particular project I was working on where we actually looked at the type of tenants and what we thought they could get based on having conversations with them. So. Just as an enterprise value perspective, PNC Bank paired 10 of their legacy branches, people doing the same work, with 10 of their green branches. So they built 10 green branches. And they adjusted this for weather, occupancy, and square footage, and so forth. And they engaged the Berkeley Center for the Built Environment to actually evaluate a number of things. So they did post-survey of the occupants. So 
couple of things. So first off, let's look at their energy savings. In those legacy branches, legacy branches, they ran the gambit. They got 10, 10 branches, and they run like this, right? So some of them are good. Some of them were really, really, really bad. And so you get sort of the average, right? Now, let's look at their green branches. The green branches, not only is their energy, energy use much better than their legacy branches, but going to your question earlier about, you know, if you look at the enterprise and sort of more of these institutional owners, this is their, this is their volatility. They, re, they increase their predictability of their operating expenses dramatically, 85%. So I, as a, as a company owner, as a corporate owner, have much greater predictability in my expense items, so then I can then make choices on how I want to invest my money and my capital elsewhere. So then let's look at occupant, you know, the folks that actually work in the building. How happy are they? So they ask them, you know, how, how generally how satisfied you are, are you in your workplace? So these are the legacy branches. 64% were fairly satisfied generally. 43% were satisfied with the building, thermal comfort, so forth. You can sort of see lighting. They were actually pretty good on lighting. Acoustic quality. So let's look at the green branches. In the green branches, their general satisfaction has gone up to 93%. The satisfaction with the building, 98%. As opposed to what? Down here somewhere? So you can see when they did pre and post occupancy studies that the occupants, in fact, are happier. So what does that translate? So that's all nice. That's good. You've got happier workers. So what does that mean, right? They did a study using um, these folks out of Notre Dame, Conlin and Glavis, did the study in March of 2012 comparing the branches. And what they found after adjusting for demographics, income level for where the branches were in the green branches. They had more productive and engaged workers, and they made, per year, $461,000 of increased revenue per employee. Yes, Ari. This one? This one? Oh, before the case study. Sure. Here? Okay. <laughs> yes. Salary. Bad space. Is that what? Yes, Daniel. Sorry. So the, the question is, is the 70 to 150 percent of estimated salary to replace staff, is that annual salary? Yes. So if you go, if I am Bank of America, or in this case PNC Bank, and I have to go hire a recruiter to go do it, and I have downtime because I've got somebody who's left and I've got a replacement, I have other staff that has to, so they've actually done studies, and this is what they, what they found is between 70 and 150 percent. So if you do, if you're looking at, and this is what I've done in the work that I've done, is I say, okay, so let's take this occupant of this building and we can run a number that's between 70 and 150 percent. What if it's only 35 percent, right? Pick the number, Mr. Client, that feels comfortable to you and I'll use that number. But let's agree that we can bracket it like this. This is what, this is, you know, well-known human resources studies say this is the number between 70 and 150 percent to replace an employee. So those are real numbers that you can actually so we just bracket it and say, okay, so you, ha you as a tenant have a bottom line number. What's the impact to me as a tenant if I'm in a building? And, of course, you have to sell them that this is a building that is going to make them more comfortable, that has better air quality, that, that, they're, you know, that their staff is going to like better. I think that you know, these studies suggest that, in fact, the occupants do like this building better and probably are at work more frequently than they were before. Because it trans, whoops, I made that, made it go away. Translates into a big number per employee. So let's look at the tenant, which is quite similar to, you know, sort of that enterprise level. And what we're looking at is from a financial perspective, we talked about CAM charges, energy costs, and predictability. 
Again, for those small Class C building tenants, energy and utility costs are huge numbers for them in terms of whether or not they make rent every month. So if we can reduce that, you have less risk in your building. If we look at brand enhancement, a number of companies are trying to brand themselves as being green because it appeals to a certain segment of the marketplace. Occupant health and productivity. Again, we can come up with numbers that specifically drive to that. Staff recruitment and retention and then strategic positioning. These all equate to specific monetary returns. So let me give you an example. This goes to the question. I think, Charlie, you had about tennis. Okay. This is a project we're working on. And we have two tenants. These are both um, these are both consulting firms. And both of them have sustainability initiatives. So they have big components. One of them, I can't remember which one, is a big, um, I mean, they have a whole sustainability practice. So we said, well, okay, what if, they, what if they were able to increase productivity for each of their staff members who does, who does their advisory work by 15 minutes a day? What if? So 15 minutes a day, 48 weeks a year, equals 60 hours of additional productivity per employee per year. At $100 an hour, that's $6,000 in revenue per year per employee. In this case, we have a 400-person firm in this building. That's $2.5 million to their bottom line. So if I'm trying to convince a tenant to stay in my building, or to come to my building, and I show them this, and I, and I can convince them that what I have done in my high performance building makes their space more comfortable, easier to, you know, that the, the staff wants to stay there longer, then this translates, you know, pick a number. I don't care what the number is, but just because you can't, you know, the null hypothesis that it's not worth anything is not accurate. It's worth something. And you can actually drive down to a tenant level, an occupant level, and, and show this to whether you are the building owner and the occupant or whether you have a tenant who is the, building, is the occupant. All you need to know is what do they do, how much do they pay their staff, and you can run the numbers. So again, I just wanted to show you this outline of where these things show up in the, in the numbers. Productivity is an income expense line item. You know, if I'm an advisor, if I can bill more hours, I have a law firm who said, you know, we did just move into a lead platinum building, and as compared to where I was, and this is this is in a in one of my Montana projects, it was actually in not the building I was working in. He said, you know, we just built a lead platinum building, and as compared to the building we were in before, you know what I noticed? That it's five o'clock way earlier than it was in my old building. And I said, well, did you do any studies on whether or not? your attorneys are any more productive. He goes, you know, I didn't, but you know, if they were billing 15 minutes more a day because they're staying here longer and it's got better light and it's more comfortable, that translates to a big number to my bottom line. And he said, what I do know is that I am able to recruit lawyers from outside of Montana far more easily in this building than I could before, which again, shortens his recruitment time, which shortens his cost to his bottom line. So again, what I'm just trying to show here is there are, you, you can tie all of these components to a particular item on your income statement. You know, whether it's health, expense, recruitment and retention, expense, enterprise, brand, leadership, best in class, income, risk. The carbon footprint has, you know, carbon credits or renewable energy credits, additional leasable space, income. You start to get the sense of where you can see these returns. And I'm going to skip that last comment because it's complex and requires a lot of explanation. <laughs> so from a community perspective, what we're looking at is if you're able to increase, if you have more people in your building, if you the rising tide lifts all boats, that impacts jobs. It impacts your tax base. It impacts economic vibrancy, social health and well-being. So, you know, from the perspective of a, of a real estate owner who is, the, who is creating a building, are creating an environment, then what you find is that is that you are actually benefiting the community. And really, as owners of property, isn't that really our job is to create a better place? I mean, where do we spend most of our time? In our building, right? I mean, fundamentally, buildings are framed in the context of the communities they're in.
I mean, there is absolutely unprecedented transformation in tenant demand, no question about it. All right. So I've way gone past my time. And, okay. You don't need to see this. I will we'll let you ask questions. But I wanted to show you, we can talk, if you want to talk later about various financing structures, there are a whole bunch. whole bunch. And I'd be happy to talk about this later. Now we'll get moving to the formal Q&A um, session for uh, this particular talk. Remember, if you're listening online, uh, we'll be using this mic to travel around. You can hear us. And also, um, you can ask questions by typing in your questions pane. I'll be rotating around and check those frequently to see if there are any online questions. So I believe running to there has hand up first. Thanks, Molly. Great talk. I'm curious to know about the number of times you had this conversation or similar conversation with potential clients and what the numbers show in terms of uh, how many times potential clients fight. It, may, it makes sense to me, and I want to see you know, everybody get on board with doing right. it. But like, are we seeing 5% of the time or 10% of the time that you, you're making this argument that people get it and that they're going along with it, or is there still a slot here? Yeah, um, when I can articulate the business case in sort of that going through the process, People generally get it. That doesn't mean they're willing to spend 36 bucks a foot, but they get it. So, you know, I'm working on a big project right now, and they say, we get it, and it's still 36 bucks a foot, and we need to have the money to do it. So I, I would probably say today, and particularly since I'm doing a lot of work in these gateway cities, you know, it's, way, it's 60 70%. Um, but I have had a major, major client say, you yeah, know, not interested. We don't care even though their major tenant in their building said, we will leave. So I suspect I'll get a call from them in two years from that major tenant. I mean, that, they said, we will leave if you don't do something. So. Like, do you want me to just give you a pitch for my book? <laughs> wow, that was good. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, there are co so yes, my book is great because it's just sort of the 101 version of how to do it. But um, there are, you know, a number of different places you can get it. And I have a whole resource list. And if you guys want that resource list, I can pass it off to these guys and you can Get it, but you know certainly my book, Practical Greening, but also, you know the uh, Green Building Finance Consortium, Scott Muldavin. If any of you guys know him, Scott has this 501 version of the book, which is even hard for me to understand, but it has everything. So you can go to greenbuildingfinance.com or something like that, um, and you can. It's called anybody at IDL. Do you remember what it's called? Because um, I know Nia funded it, part of it. Anyway, so there, there are several places you can go. BOMA has some, you know, the Building Owners and Managers Association has some cost numbers. You know, what you can also do is if you go to the Energy Star website, there's a, a building value calculator on there that you can play with. It does not, it basically it's only energy savings and utility savings, but you can, you can go there and play, you know, play on there as well. And if you want specific resources, I will pass them on to IDL and um, let them, and they can send out sort of a list of all the various things. Hi. Huh? <laughs> sure, you know, I did do two trainings in Seattle. Um, on for BOMA, for BOMA and NIA. Um, and so there is a <laughs> curriculum that's put together that is a very specific curriculum. It's like a four or five hour, four hour curriculum. So yes, we could definitely do that. I was like, 
And in general, so uh, we did market this through the IFMA and IVO newsletters and their Facebook pages. So they did. It's uh, a little bit of uh, advertising. Molly, we're always hearing about the national trends. Yes. Um, and Idaho here is a little bit different, as you know. You've worked like here. Montana. Like Montana. Um, with your example about the appraiser, where you walk through yes. your thought process yes. and the way you look at total total value, um, and also um, in the lead, you know, in, in the in the the way that you say the market is valuing lead, that there's credibility there, that, that it says to a tenant or to a buyer, this is probably a well managed building, and therefore it probably is going to be a better asset. Can you talk to what you're saying in Idaho or Montana or what the gap is there or how we can build those those studies more um, to define that better? Yeah. You know, it, when I, I did, a, I worked on a project uh, about a year ago in here, and, you know, I, I think I mentioned to you that, you know, trying to find comps on what lead buildings were here in Boise was a real challenge. And, I, you know, there is no doubt that if you look at, um, you know, I, I, I know that you like the Banner Bank building and other, you know, lead buildings. I mean, I know that the one that's going up now is, a, is going to be a lead building. What we're seeing is that things are leasing up more quickly. Um, and then, but then translating that to articulated, I think really, it's, I don't think talking about it as lead or, because that tends to be looked at as being sort of out there on the fringes for some of us sort of in the center of the country. And really, you I talk about high performance, talk about modernization, talk about the repositioning of the asset and the, and the renewal of the asset. I mean, if you think about renewal, what you've now done is instead of, if you have a lifespan of, of, of component parts, you've now just pushed that out another 20 years, right, or more. And so part of what you're doing is you're renewing the building, repositioning the asset so that you're competing at a higher level. That's where I think that's how you frame it. I don't think you frame it as, in certain markets, I think right now, it's harder to frame it as a lead or an energy star building, frankly. Yes? My policy map? The policy yes. map. And you mentioned that cities are leading the way. Yes. And I presume that a lot of data that you have to quantify the positive return on investment is coming from some of these cities or these states where the data may be available. Right, right. So how do we get our municipal elected officials to do that here in Idaho? How do we crack that nut? <laughs> if Austin, you know, I mean, well, Austin's well, a good example. <clears throat> well, you know, so, so, you know, it's funny because I go and I work in places and they go, well, you know, Austin, you can't use Austin as an example. I thought, well, you know, if I'm working in Montana, why wouldn't Texas be a good example? But Austin doesn't count. So, you know, I mean, I think part of what you do is you actually create partnerships and you create sort of the, uh, what is it when you have a uh, sister city? I mean, I think those kinds of creating sort of those relationships between cities so you can show best practices. And, and you know, from a practical reality, a number of the places I'm working at, the municipality also is owns part of or is in, involved in the utility. And so they're looking at what does their grid look like? What does their supply of energy look like? What, it, what do they expect in the long run? And they are recognizing that if prices continue to increase or the volatility is wild, that it will impact the vibrancy and the health of their community. So part of it is, is articulating it in that way. You know, we talked a little bit about eco-districts earlier, so. All right, we've got about five more minutes uh, worth of Q&A, so keep questions coming. I've got a quick one, uh, an energy question. So when you were talking about the uh, Montana project, that was just 23,000 uh, 23, square, square feet. Yeah. feet. Um, you had shown that a 40% energy reduction translated to 11% overall maintenance and operations reduction. And that number, to me, uh, was one of the first times I've, I'd seen the distribution. I was wondering what makes up that operations um, and maintenance budget. Like, what is the distribution? So energy is a small portion of that. What portion is, you know, um, equipment maintenance, salary? I mean, what goes into that number? You may or may not have the numbers off. I don't have it off the top of my head, but it would include things like management fees, um, legal fees, um, cleaning. You know, it's sort of just what it takes to operate the building. Um, you know, HVAC contracts, things like that. Yeah, you know, those kinds of things. I'm surprised that forty percent was only eleven percent. Yeah, it, you know, in, in that particular building, water, water, yeah, all sorts of sort of all the basic stuff. 
Um, so going back to the energy policies of mm -hmm. different states and cities, um, I know they've got some different programs in different places. Um, in your experience, do you know, do those programs benefit investors differently than they do tenants, or, or are they different aspects of the different policies that might lean towards tenants more than investors? Or how do you see the, the, the benefits of those systems distributed between those two groups? Interesting question. Um, I would say right now it's probably distributed more towards investors because typically it's on that, that sale transaction and I think that many of the tenants are not, in many markets the tenants may not be as sophisticated or as able or as willing or used to going and looking for the data as investors might be. Um, but I think transparency is the key, and where there's transparency and the opportunity to get the data, uh, you know, like in New York City, you know, you are seeing major tenants who are taking lots of space and are fairly sophisticated, know where to go look for it. They are absolutely looking for it. But I, I would say probably in the investor market rather than the tenant market right now. Um, so you mentioned you work mostly on the retrofit projects. Right my, now. That right may just now. be a market-driven thing. Okay. Uh, my question is, do you see more value given to more visible um, measures, like, say, daylighting or, mm -hmm. you know, more Lighting. architectural than mechanical because sure. those translate through sure. to the tenant? You know, part of it is telling the story, and so I would say I would never do any sort of a um, high-performance retrofit without doing lighting, uh, you know, for example, um, controls. To the extent that you can create something where they can feel it and see it. I mean, lighting is such an easy one to do. And when you sort of dollar cost average it in with everything else, it, it, it's like kind of a no-brainer to do. Um, but, you know, I'm doing everything from windows to lighting in sort of a consolidated package right now. And part of what we're looking at is this integrated package. And if you do it all together, you get better returns all the way around. So, but, yeah, absolutely, anything visual is better. But at some point... People get tired of getting cold. People get, you know, and those main, and they're like, you know, this is not a great place for me to be as a, as a worker. And so you start to see people, you start to see attrition in the building. And so, yes, you know, it's like the lobby. I mean, yeah, you can do the lobby, but then once they step off into the floor and it looks really crummy and, you know, you see some people walking around with sweaters, you know, at some point they're going to go, this isn't the building for me, you know, so. Thank you.